What's your opinion on, I guess, for the advisor who isn't in their 50s and they haven't built a practice full of, you know, retired clients on an assets under management fee schedule. When you say niche, how does how, how are you thinking about that? You better become an expert in a market segment or and or a niche. For example, if um, you're working with Intel executives and you happen to like working with engineers, you could um, you would want to learn everything you could possibly learn about how Intel works and to help the people working there to learn how to maximize the value of the benefits and the pay and even the job that they have. You might want to be learning about coaching, about working with headhunters. When is the time for your client to find a new job? Because the value that we bring to the party is not the investments. It's the advice, it's the financial advice and the financial coaching that we give folks. Josh, Patrick, welcome to the Model FA podcast. How's your week going so far, sir? It is going great. We're having wonderful weather up here, and I'm going to get a bike ride this afternoon. Nice. Are you, you're in Vermont, right? I am. Good deal. Yeah, you and I met in a very non-traditional way. We were both at the Baby Bathwater Institute Mastermind up in uh, Utah. I think we were the only two people even remotely affiliated with the financial services industry that went to that event, 200 entrepreneurs skiing for a couple of days. Yeah, there was actually an attorney there who probably understood the industry a bit. Yeah. But other than that, it was just you and I. Good stuff, man. I enjoyed our conversation. I mean, when we were when we were there, I know we talked about a lot of things that we'll probably cover in the podcast today. I think one of the big things is just kind of the state of the industry and, you know, I guess where you see the financial services industry going, some of the trends that you're liking, some of the trends that you're not liking. I mean, maybe we start there. I mean, what are your thoughts on the financial services industry just kind of generally, and then we can dive in maybe a little bit more specific? Well, I think the financial services industry is in a great space right now. I also think that's going to change dramatically in the future just because firms are making too much money. Hmm. When, a, when the average profit in a well-run financial services firm is 30 to 40%, that is so much higher than the rest of the world that is, that is ridiculous. Um, in fact, I really can't think of a business that's better than the financial, the wealth management business, specifically the investment management side. Hmm. I mean, how many businesses do you know where you get to bill your client and the client doesn't really realize how much money they're paying? And on top of that, on an average year, you get somewhere between a 5 and a 10% price increase without having to do anything. It's pretty pretty incredible. It's lasted this long. I mean, it's been, what, about 20, 30 years that this has been going on? Well, the, the, the move to AUM um, really started when I got in about 20 years ago. But I would say in the last 5 to 10 years is when it's really taken off. Um, you know, you're seeing a lot more people giving up their securities licenses in forming RIA only firms. Mm -hmm. And in my opinion, that's a good thing to do because it actually makes you a little bit cleaner than the folks who are selling commission products. Although just because someone sells commission products doesn't mean they're not working in the client's best interest. Agreed. It, it just makes it a little bit more difficult. You still have to have morality and you still have to have a moral compass and all that kind of good stuff no matter where you are in business, if you're going to do a good job for your customers. Where do you think the margin compression is going to come in? I mean, we've made it this far. I mean, like you said, since the early 90s, people have been using assets under management as their primary way for collecting fees from clients. It seems like that trend has accelerated, if anything. Do you think it's going to reverse? Do you think it's going to slow down? Do you think there's going to be price pressure from technology? What do you think is going to cause that trend to reverse or slow? Or do you know, you? I, keep, I keep reading about price compression in the industry, and I haven't seen it yet. Um, you know, I, I, I keep reading that the gurus are saying it's there. Uh, have you seen price compression at all in the industry? No. I mean, I really haven't. Obviously, we've seen the, the release of the robo-advisors and the hybrid advisor. Um, I would say there's probably more people that are either doing it themselves or just not doing it all. Like I, I'm a big believer that there's so much noise in the marketplace that people think they're making the decision 
good decisions related to their finances, but they're probably just downloading an app like a Robin Hood and saving 10 bucks and being like, yeah, let's check this off the box for now until I'm in more pain. I, I think it's giving people an option to take vitamins instead of fixing their broken arm and they're taking enough vitamins to where they're kind of forgetting about it. But I'm worried that most of the American public is going to wake up and 20 to 30 years and recognize that they missed out on 20 to 30 years of compounded earnings and then be like, oh, crap, what do we do? Um, so I don't think there's been a lot of price compression. I just think there's been more fake solutions to the problem. Yeah, that would make sense to me also. The, but, you know, the truth is the what we call wealth management, which is servicing people with significant wealth, is a really small percent of the population, maybe 10 percent of that. Mm hmm. You know, 90% of the population, uh, robo-advisors are probably okay for, and 50% of the population doesn't save at all anyhow. Yeah. I mean, so it's true. that's a completely different issue altogether. But to answer your question, I think price compression is going to be legislated. I don't think it's going to come from the marketplace. If you look at what's going on around the world, look at what's going on in England, what's going on in Australia, um, you've seen that... This blind pricing or blind, you know, the AUM pricing model we have has been outlawed in those countries. And it's only going to be a matter of time before Congress starts taking a look at this and wants to do something about it. I mean, they tried to do it with the fiduciary standard and retirement plans, and that got killed. But at some point, there's going to be um, some people come in the, you know, in the power who have enough uh, clout in Congress that they'll actually get something passed. Yep. Do you think there's any risk that the government could get into the asset management business and just instead of causing price compression and let's say outlawing AUM or putting restrictions around what advisors are able to charge that they just start rolling out either state sponsored or federally sponsored, essentially asset management programs for retirement and other things? Potentially, but I'd be surprised if that happens. Okay. Um, you know, anything can happen, but that's not what I, you know, I don't look at that the future. What I look at is if you're not figuring out a way of adding value to a niche 20 years from now, you're toast. Mm -hmm. Now, I don't care because I'm too old, but you should care because you're at the right age where 20 years from now, you'll probably still be involved in the uh, business world. Yeah, for sure. I, so what are, what is your advice then for, I mean, I guess there's a, a lot of different groups of advisors, right? You have advisors that have built professional practices primarily through AUM. Let's say they're in their 50s, early 60s. I mean, is your advice to someone like that to sell now while the selling is good and to capture the enterprise value in the practice? Is it to develop a niche expertise so that they can start to build their practice in a more sustainable way in the event that Congress comes in and starts to pass some legislation to, and cause price compression or what, like what, what's your advice based on kind of where the advisor is at in their business? Well, if I'm 50 years or older, older, I'm likely not going to recommend you make a major change to how you run your business. Mm -hmm. Cause over the next 10, 15 years, probably nothing is going to really happen. I mean, you're going to see artificial intelligence go into robo advising and if, you're, if your business is based on investment management, you got a problem. And you're going to have a problem within 10 years, I think. You're going to really have a problem 20 years from now when Gen Z comes into um, you know, being in the investing world. And the reason is, is what is the definition of a digital native? You know, we keep hearing that millennials are digital natives. Well, they're not because millennials didn't. I mean, the Internet never really came into being to many of the millennials were in middle school or, or um, high school. Mm -hmm. So they've not really grown up with the tools of um, robo-advising and AI. But the kids growing up now will because you're going to see the cost of big data plummet and you're going to see the cost of putting together artificial intelligence plummet. But the people willing to use that won't be around. They're going to have. They're not going to be there for another ten or fifteen years. Hmm. So if you're dealing with older folks, you're probably not going to have much of a big risk anyhow. At least in my opinion, what you are going to do is you're probably going to replace your investment advice with um, buying some sort of a robo advisor access 
So they'll give you better decisions about what you should do for investing than you're going to come up with on your own. Mm -hmm. We've already started to see that trend to a, a fair degree, I think, in the past couple of years. Yeah, you know, it's, it's already there. I mean, there's some startups going on. And some of the stuff they're doing is just, I mean, you're going to see high frequency trading being brought to Main Street eventually. Mm -hmm. What's your opinion on, I guess, for the advisor who isn't in their 50s and they haven't built a practice full of, you know, retired clients on an assets under management fee schedule. When you say niche, how does, how, how are you thinking about that? Like, what's your opinion of you better for... become an expert in a market segment or, and or a niche. For example, if um, you're working with Intel executives and you happen to like working with engineers, you, could, um, you would want to learn everything you could possibly learn about how Intel works and to help the people working there to learn how to maximize the value of the benefits and the pay and even the job that they have. You might want to be learning about coaching, about working with headhunters. When is the time for your client to find a new job? Because the value that we bring to the party is not the investments. It's the advice. It's the financial advice and the financial coaching that we give folks. Yep. And, I mean, all the research shows that's where the value is seen, but that's not where the money is earned. At some point the value and the money payment are going to be aligned and it's going to be based on the financial advice you give, not the investment advice you provide. So why not just accelerate that trend if you're an advisor right now? Because one of the beliefs that I hold strongly to is, is it's very similar to that. It's people pay us for behavior modification and financial advice and you know the, help, the decisions that we can help them make to help them achieve better financial outcomes. Now, obviously, most people aren't going to write a check for behavior modification, but that's obviously one of the, the things that we provide folks as financial advisors. That's a tangential benefit to them and by engaging uh, us in a relationship. Why not just accelerate the trend and disconnect from the system that right now is very highly regulated because you need to maintain a securities license and just instead of being a financial advisor and not being able to run testimonial ads, not being able to have your clients share their story. Why not just disconnect, drop your registration and become a financial coach? Like, have you, have you, what are your thoughts on that? I think it's a great thing to do. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, to me, it, 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 that eventually is where the industry is going to end up. Mm -hmm. I think. Um, and I also think, and, and this is the, the challenging part of this is that for many people, this financial coaching can be done on a one-to-many basis. And my belief is, you, you know, that 10% that, or the 5% or the top, you know, the top 1%, those folks are always going to want to have face-to-face -face advice. I don't think they're ever going to want to go to automated advice. But for the bottom 50%, there is no reason for them not to just use online services that help them go through the process by using artificial intelligence. Yep. And, and if I'm a young advisor, I'm starting to think about what can I do to set up one-to-many programs, meaning I'm not working with you as an individual, but I might be working with 20, 30, 40, 50 people at one time, or even 1,000 people at one time. And provide advice that's basically generic based on whatever niche they happen to come from. Because the, the truth is 90 plus percent of the advice you give to the same niche, I mean, to people in the niche will all be the same. Do you think financial advice, the actual technical information as far as like, hey, this is how you need to optimize your 401k and your stock options and those types of things. Do you think that's the real value or do you think it's getting in the trenches with people and kind of learning about how they make decisions, how they process information, learning their story so that they can improve their decision making framework just generally? Or do you think it, you know, we, we move to this leveraged model where it's like we distribute our technical knowledge more broadly to more people? Um, through maybe a course environment or something like that. Can you comment on your, your belief around, um, let's say, more one-on-one -on -one intensive type advice uh, versus a leveraged environment? And, and obviously taking into account that 90% probably can't afford um, to pay an advisor uh, for that type of advice. But I'm curious to get your feedback on that. Right. Well, that was about what I was going to say. I said it's not, you know, it's not whether we, they should get it, it's what they can afford to get. Mm-hmm. 
you know, I, you know, I go to a meeting every year called the Purposeful Planning Institute it's in Denver in, in July. It's a great meeting. And it's basically aimed towards family offices, which are the large, large, you know, people with over $50 million in net worth. And, you know, many billionaires are, you know, people who serve that group are there. And I go not because I'm going to apply what they're teaching because my clientele can't afford it. I go and say, what can I strip out of this hmm. and get the essence and make it affordable for the people I serve? It's a good idea. I think more advisors should <laughs> do that as well. What are your thoughts on? So right now, if an advisor is in a regulated environment and they want to engage let's call it a thousand consumers in a leveraged model where they're distributing their advice and coaching um, to that group of people that they're at a disadvantage because marketers or media companies can do that without the regulation. So are we going to be in a position 10 years from now where all these advisors are right now they're, you know, registered uh, with the state or they're sec regulated and they're trying to build audiences. They're trying to help people in a leveraged way, but they really can't due to compliance. And then you've got all these marketing companies that are sprouting up, and, and people that aren't licensed and they're building the audiences and they're helping the, the 90 percent are advisors just going to be completely out of the mix because they're not doing that and they can't do that due to regulation and then the you know we're just going to see the industry kind of move away from today's advisor like what what, what are your thoughts on kind of where media and marketing is right now versus where an advisor is because what you're you're basically asking advisors to do is to build a marketing company because they need to engage a thousand people. So in order to engage a thousand people, they need a strategy to get in front of a thousand people. So what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think if you, that's, if you decide that's a strategy you want to pursue, you're going to drop your licenses. Okay. I mean, what you're going to do is you're going to set up a joint, you know, a joint venture where you're going to go to some robo advisor or some artificial intelligence investment device organization. Say so you're going to handle the investments we're going to handle everything else and we're going to get a good, good result for this group of people. Got it. Yeah. I love that model. I mean, that's the model that I advocate for as well. I think, you know, part of the issue right now is you've got all these younger advisors who have started these practices and they can't market, they can't do anything. <laughs> and they're selling uh, lower lifetime value services. As we've talked about the retainer kind of uh, fee for service hourly planning and then they're dealing with these huge organizations that can obviously afford the lobbying and can cross sell products and services. So it sounds like we're speaking the same language here. Yeah. Well, the truth is, it's not that they can't market; it's that they have to market. Um, they can't use testimonials, which is huge, but but it's not a killer. Um, but it, what what it does do is it makes them say, I mean, if I'm a marketer and I'm going to go out there and I've done this, I will often put my marketing stuff, say, I'd love to give you testimonials, but I legally can't do it. Yep. If I could spend $100,000 on marketing, I would spend $100,000 on testimonials and client stories. Yes. And, and that's, and you can do client stories. You just can't do testimonials. Yep. You're right. I feel like it's more more important than the testimonials, though, but because there's always that gray line where it's like, what can they say on the video, right? When does it become a testimonial? So there's always that, you know, gray area where the advisor feels uncomfortable and you don't know what to tell the client to say. And but I agree, yeah, you can do the client I, stories. I mean, you know, the, the worst that happens is the SEC comes in and or the state regulars say we don't like this ad, take it down. Pardon the interruption, friends, but I got some cool stuff to share with you. It's available on modelfa.com. It's a podcast, a blog, videos, resources, and all this really cool stuff that you don't even know about because you're not there. It's available at modelfa.com. Make sure that you check it out, watch some stuff. You're going to learn how to grow your practice, scale it, and just generate more profit so that you can do whatever you want with your time. So we'll see you there. What are your thoughts on the advisors that want to do more of the hand-to-hand -hand combat? So they don't really have an interest in building the leverage practice with thousands of people and uh, building that marketing engine. What what type of experience are they delivering for, for their clients in 10 well, I, years or so? Again, they really want to become a nitroholic. And the reason they want to become a nitroholic is that one of the good things about niches is that everybody knows you in that niche. So you become known as the guy um, who's going to, you know, who you go to to solve your problem with from this particular industry or this particular group of people. You know, it's, it's again, you know, because if you're doing one-to-one -one work, you can only work with X amount of people, maybe mm -hmm. 100 people. 
So you don't need a big group. You need a very, very, very small, tight group who will keep introducing you to other people in the group. Agreed. And everybody in the group knows that you're the person to go to to solve this particular problem. Problem. What What is your focus? I know that you know you obviously run um, a financial services practice. I believe that you also have a, a coaching business as well. Um, right. What What type of orientation do you have with your practice? What have you seen be successful with some of the advisors that you've talked to, as far as just kind of niching in general? Well, you have to say you you know like I use my example for Intel. There's a person out in Portland, Oregon, who does nothing but work with Intel employees. And that person is an expert of everything Intel. And when a senior executive needs advice, they know to call him because he's, in, he's integrated into Intel. Yep. He doesn't work there, but all the senior people say, that's who I work with. And it's not hard for him to get more people or to prove that he has legitimacy about what um, Intel employees need to be doing. Now, there was a guy when I first got in the business, I forgot who he was, but he only dealt with United Airlines pilots. That was his whole, mm-hmm. that was his whole base. He was a pilot himself. He retired, went into the financial services business, and only worked with United pilots. He knew everything there was to know that a United pilot would need to be thinking about when it came to financial independence and financial freedom. So that's an example of why a niche is so powerful. And, and the truth is, you're actually making it easier for people to say yes to you. And if you're known as an expert in a niche, you can charge more money. Yep. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of proven evidence to suggest that. What are your thoughts on niching outside of just professions? Uh, I'm a big believer in niching more towards a, a mindset or personality characteristics and things of that nature. Uh, have you seen that be successful? Is that something that you advocate for? Or are you mostly thinking fine? Yeah, no, I, I actually like that a lot. Okay. Um, I call that, you know, most people when they think about niches, think about demographics. Mm-hmm. I also think it's really important to think about psychographics. In other words, what type of person are you successful with? You know, if somebody works with me and they have an engineering mentality, they are going to hate working with me. Absolutely <laughs> hate it. Because I'm not going to give them nearly enough detail. I just won't do it. Yep. I think it's ridiculous and stupid. <laughs> and if they want to go someplace else, you're not going to get it from me. I'm going to work with mind maps because I know that's the most effective way to communicate with a client. Put everything on one page and make it so you don't have to read. I've seen that. And that's one of the areas where I've struggled uh, when it comes to sales. And I've done a lot of research. And I've, I've realized that there's actually four primary uh, buying mindsets. You've got the analytical thinkers. These are the ones that have like the calculators running in their brains, the engineers. And then you've got the experimental thinkers. Probably you and me were more about the why, the strategic value behind what we're selling and you know the, the strategic benefits of the solution. Then you've got your practical thinkers, which are more step-by-step process-driven, probably the call like the millionaire next door retiree that just wants to make sure that you have a proven process. And then the last one is the relational thinker. This is you know, this person who's kind of touchy, touching you on the arm, they're giving you a hug, they're worried about, you know, all the other stakeholders and making sure that everyone's okay. So what I've realized is, you know, I ask questions during the sales meeting to figure out what type of a primary thinking mode am I dealing with? And then I just position my process to, you know, who I'm talking to. But I agree, if I had to work with all engineers, I think I'd have to find a new career. <laughs> so I can understand why advisors would want to niche towards. And, and I, what I recommend, similar to you, it's like, find your primary thinking mode. For me, I'm that wise strategic thinker, which pushes me pretty firmly into the entrepreneur camp or the senior executive camp. Because if I'm dealing with a retiree, I'm like, hey, let's maximize the, you know, the value of your life. Let's do a wealth vision. Let's do a mind map. And they're like, dude, I'm not interested. I just want to know there's a proven process so I don't have to go back to work. I'm not a Walmart greeter. And to me, that's boring. So I think it's just acknowledging like who you are and who you were meant to serve and then just aligning your communication with people who think the same way as you because then you're going to gain energy from those conversations. If you're working with people that have different types of thinking modes, then you're going to lose energy and you're going to get frustrated. Well, there's, there's a whole huge financial services group called Kingdom Advisors. Mm-hmm. And Kingdom Advisors is based on religion. And everybody that they service has the same belief that they do around religion. 
So you're now talking the same language. Now, I'm not going to be especially successful with that group because it's not my world. Mm -hmm. But if you're a, you know, a fundamentalist and you're in the financial services world, associating yourself with kingdom advisors might be a really good thing to do. Yeah. Gives you a foundational belief system that you can use to connect with people. I think sometimes advisors are a little bit hesitant to align their personal beliefs uh, with the way they've organized themselves professionally because they feel, I don't know if they feel like that's salesy or they just feel uncomfortable with it, but I've definitely seen a little bit of a, let's call it a rebellion to that idea when I suggest it um, in our coaching calls and things with advisors. Have you kind of seen a similar thing or would you say that more advisors are kind of leaning into that, let's call it cultural or religious affiliation? I think advisors are leaning away from it. I find advisors, this is one of my issues with the industry is that, you know, they say, well, you know, I can't afford not to service somebody. And my attitude is, well, you can't afford to service some people because it's, if everything you do is a one-off, you spend all your time learning about what it is, the issues that person has. Mm. If instead I'm staying within a psychographic and demographic group, I don't have to learn. I know what the issue is before I even walk in. Now, I may not tell them that, but I know what the problem is. Yep. You know, my, my, one of the things I do a lot of is I help people create excess cash in their businesses. Now, I know before I even get on the phone with somebody, it's only going to be one of five things that we're going to talk about. And I'm not going to tell them that, but I know within five minutes what the big pain is they have and how they can solve it. Hmm. And it's not because I'm the brightest guy in the room. It's because I work with the same group of people over and over and over again, and they all have the same problem. Yep. You notice the pattern. Yeah. You know, I was on the phone with a guy this right before we started recording this. And in five minutes, I knew he was that he grew his business too fast and ran out of cash. Hmm. And then I, I asked him one question, who's your bank? And he said, Chase. No, it's a Citigroup. Excuse me. And I said, well, that's your problem. You got the wrong bank. I said, you need a community bank. I, now, I knew that's one of the five roads we would go down is bad banking relationships. I can't tell you how many small businesses decide they're going to bank with a money center bank and they think that that's the right thing to do. It's the absolute wrong thing to do and it's even idiotic. Hmm. What are the other four, just out of curiosity for anyone who's thinking about serving business owners? Is there any other pain points or questions that you kind of... Yeah, they, 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 they don't have a recurring revenue stream or they can't make one look, look like a recurring revenue stream. They have no marketing in place. They have no sales process in place. They, um, uh, the cost of operation for their business is too high. They haven't systematized their business. Uh, they are hiring the wrong people and they can't get good people to come to work. I mean, it's, it's somewhere in those levels. It's really pretty easy to, to come across. But essentially, almost all small businesses have either hit a cash wall where they don't have enough cash to run the business or there's not enough capacity because the owner doesn't know how to delegate and they become the bottleneck in the business. Mm. The e myth style on the uh, e myth. It's actually, I mean, e I mean, if you do the e myth, you're going to kill yourself because it's way too <laughs> detailed. The e myth is designed for engineers. Got it. In my opinion, I'm a I'm a bigger fan of of uh, using traction if I'm going to use a system. Yeah, I love that book. Yeah. What what? Because uh, I know you. I think you had a manufacturing background before you got into financial services. Is that right, Josh? No, I actually have a food service background. Food service. I used to own a food service okay. company where we fed people in factories. So I'm sure that a lot of your knowledge as it relates to growing and scaling and cash flowing businesses is related to your experience in, in food service because you had, you had success there. How does an advisor who maybe wants to service business owners or entrepreneurs who doesn't have that skill set or that background, I mean, do you think that's mandatory? Do you think it can be taught? Like how do they develop that expertise? Because you're not going to learn that in the CFP curriculum. No, no, you're not going to learn much in the CFP curriculum. Um, <laughs> I knew I liked you, Josh. <laughs> and I'm a CFP, by the way. <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, one way you can learn, you can join my mastermind program. <laughs> oh, nice. Tell me about that. <laughs> um, 
Well, I was on another podcast, another financial services podcast, and I had several people call me afterwards and say, can I shadow you? Will you mentor me? And, and I knew none of these folks could afford my one-on-one fee. So I said, I'll tell you what, um, if I get six people, I'll put the, we'll start a mastermind program and I'll cap it at 14. So I'm putting together a program and it's pretty much done now for advisors who want to learn how to work with private business owners. I'm going to take you through the, uh, you know, the steps of how you recognize what they need to do. And we're going to have a monthly long call where we'll do hot seats and we'll basically use, do case studies. Nice. Yeah, it's going to be sort of like, you know, a, a business school, a Harvard Business School case study methodology for how you're going to learn to work the important things, the simple things that private businesses can do to help make themselves um, more successful or sust- what I call economically sustainable. And by the way, economically sustainable biz- for a business is true for any business that exists, including financial advisors. And the four areas are having a great lifestyle, having an emergency fund in place in case you have a downturn. And it isn't if, it's when. Mm-hmm. The third thing is, is having enough capital available for a fully funded growth program, which is both sales and marketing. And the fourth area is to have enough money to fully fund a retirement plan to fill the gap that your business is not going to provide when you try to sell it. Because yeah. people, you know, business owners think that their business is going to ride them off into the future. And it's only one or two percent of the businesses in the country that ever have a chance of doing that. You know, yeah. one of the interesting little factoids is, is that of highly saleable businesses, only 50 percent that go to market ever sell. Hmm. Interesting. I, I believe it. When you think about the term business owner, like how are you defining that? I, I kind of separate it between business owners and entrepreneurs. I, I feel I find that most business owners they're they they do one thing, they grow the business, they do that for a really long time. Whereas entrepreneurs tend to have multiple businesses that they have exits and they raise cash and um, you know go after larger opportunities. I mean, are you differentiating between the entrepreneur and the business owner in your group? And when you talk to advisors and train them how to do that, are you, what, what, who are you focused on when you say business? I, I'm focused on what I call blue collar businesses or okay. main street businesses, you know, the businesses that where someone will own a business for a relatively long period of time and then right off into the sunset. Got it. Okay. Um, you know, the fast growth businesses, you know, what you're talking about, those guys are trying to become unicorns. Yep. And that's a whole different ball game altogether. And uh, once you move into the venture capital world, I have little or no interest in working with you just because I don't like the model. I think it's a terrible model. Yeah, I would agree with you. Lots of vultures in there. Well, it's not so much the vultures. It's that the failure rate is incredibly high. That too. You know, when you're, when you're building a business – just on sales and you're not paying attention to profit, you, your chance of your business surviving really isn't all that good. you got to get lucky. Mm-hmm. I think most of them are just building for a, an exit with a larger company at this point. It seems like most of the, the apps and websites and products that are spinning up are just trying well, to be sold. To- yeah, in, the tech, in the tech world, um, what you're seeing is people are building businesses and then the acquirers are buying the business, not for the business, but for the talent. Hmm. You know, like I just read a book about Facebook. I forgot who the guy wrote it, but it was about, you know, um, he was one of the people developing the Facebook ad platform. And he built a startup and Facebook bought his business so he could get him and the three other engineers. Makes sense. It's hard to get that type of talent, unless you're going to write a big check. <laughs> That's what they're doing. They're writing big checks. These guys are walking with a bunch of money, and you know, I guess the VCs make their money too. Yep. Everybody wins. Yeah. What do the characteristics look like for the advisors who are in your mastermind group? Is it usually later career advisors, early career advisors, mid-career? What's the, what's the breakout? It's, it's early, mid, mostly. I mean, a late career advisor is not likely going to want to make the changes I'm probably going to recommend. <laughs> yeah, it's true. What do you think, because we talked a little bit about this when we were in Utah, um, secession planning. Uh, we both 
we share a lot of similar opinions. Um, one, in, <laughs> like, I don't know usually, if a good or a bad thing. I don't know, man. I mean, yeah, usually there's like some points of disagreement, but I, I've pretty much agreed with everything you said on the podcast and in all of our conversations in Utah. So, um, you know, maybe great lines think alike, maybe we're both wrong, but one of the points that we were, were talking about was secession planning and continuity. I'm the byproduct of a failed secession plan. I purchased a practice up in Sacramento a number of years ago with some uh, partners who put up the capital and it was a complete disaster. Um, I mean, topic for another day. But uh, one of the things that I learned from that experience was it's probably better to just have somebody, you know, in a continuity situation and free them up to work with their clients for as long as they can, instead of trying to transfer those relationships prematurely and transfer the owner's identity, which is usually what happens in those businesses onto somebody else and create all those issues with, with secession. Um, what are your thoughts on secession continuity? Where do you think we're at as an industry? What are some tips that you, you know, some things that you would advocate for if you, if you could, or you do, um, in regards to that topic? I have coached a couple of financial service firms, so I actually can speak about this with knowledge. Um, the And I have my own firm, but the, the key here is if you're going to create a business to sell, you have to make your clients the clients of the business, not the clients of the advisor. Mm. And that's the biggest challenge that financial service firms have in that for two reasons. One is... The advisor is like the ego of having being the client's advisor. And the second is to make a client a client of a firm, that means you have to have several people touching the client. Yep. So if somebody leaves, you just move someone into that slot. I mean, more, I mean when you look at uh, what Goldman Sachs does, Goldman, you're not a client of Joe Smith who works at Goldman. You're a client of Goldman Sachs, and if Joe Smith leaves, there's another person that comes in and takes Joe Smith's place, and the relationship keeps going like nothing happened. But if you're working for ABC Financial Services Company, and you're the company, or you're the advisor, and you're the only person they ever talk to at that firm, you basically have made your business not transferable. Now, you can sell your business, and the way people sell businesses in this industry is completely idiotic, <laughs> is that they take 35% down and do owner financing for 65%. And anybody who spends any time in the mergers and acquisition world is going to tell you the only money you can count on is the money you get at closing. Mm -hmm. So you're really selling your business for one-third of what you think it's worth. You know, I used to blog for the New York Times, and I had several blog posts I wrote about financial service firms where the sales just went completely upside down and terribly wrong. Uh, there was one case where um, the person I was writing about, not only she did not get her payout, she ended up getting fined by the state and had to write a big check herself to the state because of inappropriate sales practices the new owner was doing, but she was still on the hook somehow. Jeez, that's brutal. Well, it's like the same people who sell businesses and they stay as an officer of the company and the buyer doesn't pay the payroll taxes. Guess who's on the hook for the payroll taxes? <laughs> yep. The selling idiot who stayed as an officer. I've got my fair share of war stories, man. Um, I mean, we were getting crushed with phantom income just due to the way that we had structured the deal. Um, by, at, back then, I had very little experience in M&A and valuation and deal structure since then I've, I've definitely sh sharpened up on that but it was uh yeah it was an interesting time interesting you know, basically everything you just explained was a, was a big issue yeah I, in my opinion the way to get out of the wealth management business is what i call the wind down strategy um are you familiar with the 80 20 rule oh yeah okay well if you take your book of business and you 80 20 it the meaning that you take that top 20% of your clients and you keep them and you jettison the bottom 80%, you're going to end up making more money in working part-time. And if you 80-20 it again and you 80-20 it again and 80-20 it again, eventually you end up with no clients and you just close your doors and walk away. Hmm. But you're going to be having gotten a whole lot more money yep. than you ever would have if you had sold it much safer 
one of the biggest problems that people have when they get out of their business is seller's remorse. And the reason they have seller's remorse is they lose all the relationships with the people they used to work with. And when you 80-20 your business, you don't lose any of those relationships. So you're not going to have seller's remorse. Yeah, I think it's a great way to do it. I mean, we're basically doing the same model inside of SurePath for advisors that join that are a little bit later stage in their business. Uh, we're just providing a little bit more infrastructure just in the event that something happens to them, because that's kind of the challenge, right? If you're 80-20ing it, obviously you're cutting the clients, but you still have some liability and exposure if it's just you. So the, what we've just decided to do is instead of forcing advisors to sell, they just kind of merge in. It's a cashless transaction, and we just help them manage the lower end of the book and whatever clients they don't really want to service anymore, and then just free them up to do what they like to do, which is generally, uh, if they're a successful advisor, to spend time with their clients. But 100% agree with that 80-20 principle of kind of cutting the lower end and just kind of cash flowing it out. You'll definitely make more money that way. Yeah, it's a great, it's a great, it's a great model to do. Um, you know, you, you providing that type of service is a really good service for people who are my age that want to slow down but don't want to stop. Mm -hmm. Had to learn it the hard way because it was really pushing during that sale to get the advisor when I had the failed succession plan to, to sell the business and just... Yeah, battle scars from that um, kind of, I guess, led to some creative thought around how we would handle c continuity. But yeah, man, I'm, I'm, I'm excited to, uh, we should have another talk about a different topic at some point. I think we're, we're pretty much at time, Josh, but I've really enjoyed our conversation. Oh, cool. This is always fun. I really enjoyed it, Patrick. Absolutely. I'll, uh, we'll be sure to include some links for everyone who's listening uh, to Josh's mastermind, his business, so you can check him out. And uh, Josh, I look forward to having you on the podcast again at some point. I'd be happy to do it. All right. Cool. Well, I Thanks. will talk to you soon, Josh. Thank you talk for your time. Bye-bye. You Bye. -bye. Bye.